The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysig, and my partner, Malik Hill. We went back to the regular intro, unfortunately. I'm still working on a completely new one, but uh, we're sticking with this one just for a little bit. And right now, it's okay because the, the Pistons actually won. They beat a good team in the OKC Thunder, so I guess it's okay for, for now. Uh, Malik, we got a lot to talk about. We got some, some little NBA updates. Um, there's been a lot of crazy things in college basketball. And unfortunately, we have to do some decompressing and some... A little some, bit of therapy. Some home therapy. Fan therapy. Yeah. Uh, Lions, tough way to end their season. We'll get into that. But uh, overall, how how we doing? I'm doing good. Yeah. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it might be a downside that the Pistons won the same day the Lions <laughs> yeah. lost. But we don't believe in that extra curse stuff. We don't? Listen, the, the Lions, for the most part, broke the curse of Bobby Lane. No yeah. playoff wins in over 50 years. They did it. Mm-hmm. They won two playoff games, 14 wins, huge season for the Lions. Do Painful you, ending. Do you agree that Jeff Daniels and Peyton Manning broke the curse back when they – I love that clip, but <laughs> listen, it, if you believe in sports superstitions, they may just have. Right. Because they the, they, they got really extra with it. Mm-hmm. So it's I pretty respect funny. It. Yeah. Um, we'll get in the Lions season and maybe a little bit of what they can do in the off season um, a little bit later. But I just wanted to start with the NBA. Um, we had another big uh, scoring week after Embiid and Cat. We talked about last week putting up seventy and sixty two. Uh, that was on. Was that the anniversary of Kobe's passing? It was the it was the anniversary of his eighty one. Okay, yeah. so then this week was the anniversary of his passing, correct? And then, I believe so. And Luka Doncic scored 73 points. Yeah. Devin Booker. I believe is the fourth highest in NBA history. Tied yeah. with Wilt, of yeah. course. Devin Booker had a very uh, solid night as well. He had a 62-point outing. Solid. Yeah. Very, solid, solid 62. Solid 62. Yeah. But uh, Luka, 73, he would be the one guy that I would figure would have eventually gotten to this kind of game. Um. But normally, my knock against Luca lately has been his inefficiency, and he was hyper efficient in this oh, game. It, it was. It doesn't make sense when you look at the stat line. Yeah, uh, to put up seventy three and shoot as good as he did, um, I'll pull up the stats. But it was incredible to see. Um, do you take anything out of this game, or is it just another one of those like he was just on? I mean one? it. It threw me off guard because I was working when it, while it was happening. Mm-hmm. I, I got an alert that said he had 41 at the end of the first half, 44 at the end of the first half. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is this is pretty big. Right. That doesn't happen a lot. And then I saw he had 59 at the end of the third. And I was like, is he about to break 81 mm-hmm. or at least get to it? Yeah. And I think if the Hawks didn't double team him for the entire quarter, right, it might have happened. Yeah, but he he was completely unstoppable. Part of it is because the Hawks defense isn't good, right? But part of it is just because he was on a heater. Mm-hmm. Like you see the threes he was hitting in the third, and how the turnarounds off the glass. He was just in the zone. Yeah, he and was. He, he was talking to the crowd. He was all the way in yeah. to the moment. He shot 25 of 33 from the field, 8 of 13 from three. He had 10 rebounds in this game, seven assists. He was three assists off of a 70-point triple-double. It doesn't make any sense. Could you imagine if that would have happened? I don't. And he only had four turnovers, too. Like, that's the crazy part, too, as much as he handles the ball uh, and things like that. It's just, it's crazy. He's definitely, like, is he the best one-on-one player in the NBA right now? 
it would have to be. Uh, it I might guess. be him or Shay. Yeah, because that's fair. Shay isn't giving you sixty and seventy, but he's giving you thirty almost every night. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Devin Booker is up there. There, there are four or five guys you would list mm-hmm. where just one on one, they're pretty much unstoppable. Yeah. And right now, Luca is just behind Joel Embiid in points per game. Joel is at thirty five at point three. Luca's at thirty four point seven. So that's pretty crazy. Um, some of the standings pretty much, pretty much the same. Uh, but the one thing we wanted to bring up was the Knicks. You said they're 14 and two in their last, in the, in the month of January, they have 14 wins. I'm pretty sure they're 14 and two in their last 16. Yeah. And they've won eight in a row right now. They're nine of their last 10. This is the first time they've won 14 games in a month since 1993. Mm -hmm. And that year they made the finals. Yeah. And right now they're sitting at uh, third in the East behind Boston and Milwaukee, which pretty much has been what it's been most of the season. Um, And then Cleveland is fourth. Philadelphia is still just in fifth. Indiana is sixth. Miami, Orlando, Chicago, and Atlanta uh, round out seven through ten. Any other standouts there that you wanted to bring up? Uh, NBA-wise? Yeah. Yeah. We just talked about this in pre-show. <laughs> I don't know how I wasn't ready for this. Um, like, is there any Eastern Conference teams that have been a surprise? Honestly, outside of the – well, Cleveland is a surprise, honestly, because they have – they're 7-3 and three in their last 10. Yeah. And they've done it without Darius Garland mm-hmm. or um, their power forward, Evan Mobley. Yeah. Uh, they've done it with Isaac Okoro and Dean Wade for the most part, which is really funny. Mm-hmm. Their defense has been really good, and they've gotten production off their bench. Right. So Cleveland is playing pretty well. But yeah, out, out of anybody, New York is – they're just – they're playing better than almost anybody in the conference. Yeah. Besides Boston, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're – Jalen Brunson is averaging like 30 in the month of January. Dante DiVincenzo hit nine threes last night. Yeah. Like, that, everything is just working for them right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you make of Philadelphia right now? They just lost to the uh, Warriors last night without Klay Thompson. Uh, Philly is the five seed. Uh, before the season started, I had uh, no faith in them making a deep playoff run. Okay. I still don't believe Joel Embiid will do this in the playoffs because he hasn't done it before. Yeah. He is a high-level, almost all-time great regular season player, mm-hmm. it seems. He's averaging almost 36 a game. It's incredible what he's doing but yeah it's, i there's nothing that's tell that tells us he's going to do this in the playoffs yeah and besides him be tyrese maxi deserves to be in the most improved player argument he sh- I, I believe he should be the winner mm-hmm. he's averaging like 26 a game on high efficiency and he should be an all-star but outside of them two who do you love yeah Tobias Harris, I guess. Listen, I haven't loved Tobias since Detroit, and he was yeah. my guy when he was here. Mm-hmm. He was my favorite player when he was in Detroit. But you know Tobias Harris is going to give you like 16 a game, most likely. Mm-hmm. You got Pat Bev off the bench, like Furkan Korkmaz. What what else are you listing? Kelly Oubre. Yeah. <laughs> he hasn't. He's going to give you like 25 or he's going to give you 10. Yeah. He hasn't been fully healthy most of the year either. So uh, there's nothing that gets me excited about Philadelphia long term. Yeah, honestly. So, really, I I don't see anybody beating Boston at this point. Miami is on like a six game losing streak. Mm-hmm. Ever since they traded for Terry Rozier, yeah, they they have other moves to make because mm-hmm. things just aren't flowing right now. Yeah, even though they can still just pop up in the playoffs like they always do. Mm-hmm. But to make a run for a championship, they need to make some more moves. Right. And, uh, yeah, the Pistons are better than the Washington Wizards in my eyes. But they lost to the Wizards. They did. But they also beat them a few weeks ago. Yeah. And I don't like pretty much anybody on Washington's roster, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Bilal Koulibaly has had a secretly solid rookie season. Yeah. But to uh, who else are you getting excited about on that? The Pistons have, like, four guys that you want to keep. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think the the Wizards have more than one guy that you really want to keep. Let's see. You still um, in? You still in on Denny Avdia, Joey? You a big Denny fan? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know is going to be your answer for ninety percent of that roster. Yeah, I guess you're probably right. Are you? Do you have stock in Johnny Davis? Are you? Do you still have hope? No. 
<laughs> okay. I, did I ever have hope? I don't think so. Uh, good answer. But yeah. So name name the person that you will have stock in on that roster. Yeah, I guess you're right. No. I, I can't think of one. Tyus Jones is a high level backup. Yeah. But I don't want him starting right. on a good team. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty rough. Yeah. Landry Shamit. You like Landry? Uh, he's all right. <laughs> he's all right. I like Corey Kispert a little bit. Yeah. But on a losing team, I don't think Corey Kispert has any value right. at all. Yeah, that's fair. Um, Again, NBA trade deadline's coming up, so things can happen. Uh, teams can make some moves, so we'll see if any big ones come up. I don't – I really don't see anything crazy coming up, but you never know. Um, in the Western Conference, still also kind of the same. We got Minnesota, number one, hanging on by a thread. Denver right behind them, and then OKC in third right now because they lost to the Pistons. Crazy. Without Cade, by the yeah. way. Jalen Duren had a 22-21-7 game. Yeah. He's been Just insane. Pistons fans, you're probably not listening. You're probably not paying attention. Yeah. We can't get rid of him. We just can't. That's what I said. Yeah. I said out of there, all. He's, one of, he's like the one you, we can't get rid I of. I said I put him above Cade in the guys that I don't want to get rid of. So, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, then we have the Clippers at fourth, uh, Sacramento and Phoenix, five and six. Then we got Dallas, New Orleans, Lakers, Jazz. And then there's Houston, Golden State, Memphis, Portland, and San Antonio. Any teams within the playoff realm that you want to bring up? I think the Clippers are secretly the most dangerous team in the West. Like, if I had a dollar for every year that people said that, I'd have a lot of dollars. I understand that. <laughs> I'm just that, not that's a That's a valid point. I'm not a believer in the Clippers but anymore. They are successfully using Russell Westbrook. Mm -hmm. James Harden is happy in his role. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George have been like mostly healthy for the season and playing at a high level. Mm -hmm. They're getting good to really good production out of almost everybody. And Ty Lue was coaching them very well. Like him managing to have Russell Westbrook, James Harden, Paul George, and Kawhi Leonard all, all at the, these stages of their careers. And they're all happy. And they're all enjoying their roles and playing good basketball together. That's That's not Clippers stuff usually yeah it's usually that's a chaotic mix in most other franchises and it's working that's fair for the clippers to me that that's a sign of things being different because you you had james kd and Kyrie in brooklyn and it they barely played together and it never was gonna last mm -hmm. james and philly was over in a blink of an eye yeah he's getting thrown in with all these different like alpha male uh attitudes and it's it's working right now. Mm -hmm. If everybody stays in these roles and they're comfortable where they are, I I don't know, man. I I I believe in Tyloo as their coach, mm -hmm. and the way they've played. I I just I believe in what they're doing right now. Okay. Uh, since we're just a little bit past the halfway point on the season, do you think the Warriors can sneak into the playoffs? No. Okay. Steph would have to average over 30 for the rest of the season for that. Yeah. Clay is, I don't think that version of Clay is ever coming back that we knew. Mm -hmm. That was a high level defender and elite of elite all time shooters. I was going to say, I think that's his biggest problem. It seems like his defense has gone down tremendously. Yeah. His injuries have affected who he was. Yeah. Do you think they maybe trade Clay Thompson? That was a, a, a thought at one point. It it depends on what they trade for, because you need another all star next to Steph mm -hmm. to like make some type of run. Yeah, and I, I that that Boston run they had maybe was their last run. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it's Draymond Green is back off his suspension and still hitting people in the in their faces, mm -hmm. and still just doing Draymond stuff. Yeah, I think uh, Pods Brandon Pajemski. I don't think he's ready. Mm -hmm. I don't think Kuminga's ever going to hit this next level ceiling in Golden State at least. They don't really use Moses Moody, and that confuses me. Yeah. I think they just don't know what they want to be and Chris or Paul's who they been, are. 
Chris Paul's been hurt. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't think they know what they are, and I don't know if they'll ever find that out throughout the season. Do you think that? So this is something I've been hearing lately. Do you think Steph Curry is still a warrior for life, or do you think he tries to go somewhere? as his career is somewhat winding down. I would be shocked if he left Golden State. To me, he's he's in the mold of the guys like Dirk mm-hmm. or like Kobe where I, I it would be – I would kind of look at Steph sideways if he requested a trade this late. Mm. Like, you've got your four rings. You're in Golden State. You've established one of the greatest things in this era of basketball. Yeah. You changed basketball. And now you just want to go ring chasing, yeah. That that would that would be odd to me. Mm-hmm. Now it's clear you can see the frustration every single game with them losing these games. After right. their last loss, he re- he tore his jersey open. Yeah, like he's he's given everything he can to this franchise and this team, and it's not enough. Right after which which it. is usually a sign of somebody getting traded yeah. soon. He had but a good I, combo with LeBron, and then got mad. Yeah, but I, I still. But then See last him. night he put up 37 against Philly and they won that game. Steph is going to do what he does. So because he's that great they're still going to win games. That's mm-hmm. the thing. I don't think they ever bought him out to the point where he has to go or they need they just need to make moves to start fresh. Yeah. As long as Steph is at this level, he's they're going to keep him. Mm-hmm. And he's he's the face of the franchise. He's the greatest player in their franchise history. Yeah. I don't think he leaves. I'm just I just don't Pull. I mean, I don't think he would do that. But don't be a Tony Parker in a Charlotte Hornets jersey, please. That was rough. That's a depressing. I I'm, I wish you didn't bring that up. Yeah, it's just something that makes me think about that yeah. kind of stuff. That's man, Tony Parker in a Charlotte Hornets yeah. jersey. Don't be Darren Williams in a Cleveland jersey. Yeah, <laughs> a ghost of a player. Yeah. So uh, all right, the one thing we wanted to talk about was Victor Wembanyama. He's been doing some things. It's it's not all the way there yet, but it's starting to happen. Mm-hmm. The the demigod WTF player, yeah, that we saw in highlights and playing overseas. He he's doing stuff right now that's starting to translate. When you are playing against one of the greatest defenders of this era in Rudy Gobert. Mm-hmm. And it's something to take him outside and hit threes over him and be able to, like, take him off the dribble. And that's one thing. Right. But when you are pump faking and taking him one way and you're seven foot five and you are sham godding mm-hmm. Rudy Gobert yeah. into a finger roll layup, mm-hmm. I, that, this, this isn't. This is this isn't even two K stuff. Yeah. I don't think you can do this with V. They're probably gonna put this in the game now. Right. But I'm pretty sure this is something you couldn't even do on a video game with Victor. Add to his dribble package. Like I, it's insane. Mm-hmm. See, they're giving him more minutes now. His efficiency is going up. His numbers are going up. Yeah. Even though even though Joel and B dropped seventy, Joel and B can physically dominate almost everybody in NBA history outside of like Shaq and a few others. Yeah. But Victor still got like 30 and 12 yeah. and had a really good game himself, but it was overshadowed. And he's consistently having – they beat the Timberwolves, mm-hmm. and he was one of the biggest reasons. Yeah. Like, it, he is slowly – he's a 20 and 10 guy already. Right. The team is just so bad mm-hmm. that people might not be noticing. Yeah. They they see how talented he is, but his numbers are starting to reflect it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's something to see. And they're only going to – I mean, they're going to get another top – draft pick again this season um so they can build towards something and then i would assume because of how young their team is they're gonna have cap space and at any point the san antonio spurs can be back to the san antonio spurs that we all love and hate at the same time so something to watch out for but it's it's crazy to see how much he's developed already and he's only in year one yeah chet was the rookie of the year favorite for most of the season Mm mm-hmm and I think going coming up to All Star break, I think Ch- uh, Victor's taking it over, which is kind he's, of he's he's flashing way too much. Which is kind of a shame because if we go back to the Cade Cunningham rookie season, the reason that Scotty Barnes 
won the rookie of the year was because I'm going to be honest. I kind of forgot that happened <laughs> because his team was in the playoffs. Yeah. That's why he won rookie of the year. I would think under the same logic, Chet should be the rookie of the year, the way that he's played under a playoff team. That's just my opinion. But I think, uh, well, rules, rules, change, rules change for awards every year. Yeah. And if, if Wimby ends up averaging like 22 and 11, how do you not give him rookie of the year? Because mm-hmm. he, he's getting better every week. Yeah. So we'll see. All righty. Moving on to college hoops. I'm ramping up each and every week. There's some fun things happening. With some college hoop stuff. We're, we're getting close. Mm-hmm. We're like a month and a week away. Yeah. Pretty much. From, from March. All the, yeah, it, it's it's nuts. And uh, we'll start breaking stuff down, and we'll get to our, in my opinion, my favorite episode of the, of the year, every year, is our March Madness. But, uh, yeah, it, it's getting crazy. The top five has technically stayed the same, but uh, that's going to change next week because Tennessee just lost to South Carolina. Well, we'll get to South Carolina because they're still not ranked and something is off. I assume well, they will be soon. Yeah, that's the yeah. problem when you win on a Tuesday is that you have to wait the whole week yeah. um, to be up there. But they will definitely get in because they were the highest uh, vote getter last week. Before they're a top that three win. team in the SEC right now. Yeah. <laughs> so before they beat Tennessee, they were already looking into the top 25. So I assume this week they will for sure be. Um, but it's a wait and see. But right now, top five, Connecticut, Purdue, UNC, who also will, <laughs> after thinking about it, they'll also be out of it. Houston, Tennessee. And then we got Wisconsin, Duke, Kansas, Marquette, and Kentucky rounding out the top 10. Now, I stopped on UNC because they just lost to Georgia Tech. Yeah. Who has now, what did I say, two top 10 wins on the season? Yeah, they're only like 10 and 7. Right. But, yeah. but they're a team that has knocked off two quality opponents, which just is, is crazy at how college basketball is working right now. Um, And then, let's see. Iowa State, big jump. They're moved up to 12. They just beat Kansas in a great game. Um, And then they also beat TCU uh, last week. So, Iowa State moving up. Fun to watch. And then um, Illinois was having a pretty good run for a minute, and then they lost to Northwestern. But uh, they've won their last two games, so they might, they could potentially move up. I'm not sure. Uh, and then New Mexico keeps rising, which is fun to watch, in my opinion. But uh, I don't know. Who do you want to point out as far as college basketball teams right now? So, you don't even have to be top 25. I was about to say, before we get to the ranked team, a team that will be in the top 25 very soon, a team that nobody thought about in the preseason, they were probably projected bottom three in the SEC, second-year coach from a mid-major, a bunch of – a few transfers and some second- and third-year guys with no high-level recruiting profiles. Mm-hmm. Just an afterthought of a team, the South Carolina Gamecocks are 18-3. and three. And six and two in conference. Mm-hmm. Number two right now behind Alabama and the SEC. Yeah, it it is shocking. They are ahead. They, they might be the surprise team of the year so far. Ahead of Auburn, Kentucky, Tennessee. Yeah, South Carolina. Like, it, and when you look at their team stats, like they don't have like a superstar. Their best player is Michi Johnson, mm-hmm. who's a four year guy that came from Ohio State. Yeah. Uh, he's averaging 15 a game on 35% shooting mm-hmm. from, from three, but 40% from the field, nothing crazy. Yeah. Their second leading score is averaging 14, their third 10, their fourth 10. Like they're, they're just playing good team basketball. Yeah. There's, there's no extra standout superstar player. Right. Their coach doesn't even seem like a standout at this point because, like I said, he's just a second-year guy. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, everything is just clicking for them. Yeah. They don't make many mistakes. Mm-hmm. They play really good defense. They held Tennessee to – 59. Uh, yeah, 59 points. They hold a lot of teams to under, like, 70 points yeah. and 65 points usually. And that's, that's with Dalton Necht 
scoring 31. Yeah. Which is crazy. Like, they, they held – um well, yeah, they held Arkansas under 65. They held Kentucky to 62, Missouri to 64, uh, Mississippi State to 62. Like, mm-hmm. they have so many of these games where they make teams take difficult shots and then they just play, like, complimentary offense. Yeah. Where they run, they take open shots when they have them. Mm-hmm. They get the ball down low when they need to. They they just play, like, good old-school basketball for the most part. Yeah, they have a very um... – Texas Tech kind of vibe to them. Yeah. Which a team who is ranked. Yeah. Well, South Carolina should be on where they are ranked or even better. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I the South Carolina deserves a ton of credit because nobody believed they would be here mm-hmm. at all. And there's a good chance they might make the tournament. And who knows what they'll do once they get there. So yeah. I'm pretty sure yeah. at this pace, unless they completely fall off, they'll make the tournament. This the last time they made the tournament was under Frank Martin, and that was the year they made, like, a miracle Final Four run mm. in, like, 2016 or 17, I believe. Yeah. And the, uh, that was a really fun team that just came out of nowhere. So, yeah, mm. shouts out to South Carolina for yeah, just being a, a complete surprise. Yeah. Um, besides that, uh, in the top 25, TCU is coming in. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just beat Texas Tech last night. Yep. They've had a few big wins. Jameer Nelson, Jr., we're old. Yeah, I know. Jameer Nelson Jr. They also had beat 30 Baylor. Against them, they believe. beat Baylor in that triple yeah. J- overtime. Jameer Nelson Jr. had 30 against Baylor mm-hmm. in that game. Uh, BYU is a team that I don't think many people had ranked high in the preseason Big 12, but they're ranked 22nd right now. They're 15 and 5. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also don't really have any superstar players. They mm-hmm. just they play good basketball. Yep. Uh. I don't know how Wisconsin is sixth. <laughs> I have no idea how they're playing this well. Maybe it's just because they're so well coached. Yeah. But they're I, – I don't know, man. Like, they're shooting 30, 30, 36% from three as a team. Yeah. 47% as a team, almost 48% from the field. A.J. Storer, I didn't know why he transferred to Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Former borderline five-star recruit that went to St. John's. He's averaging 16 a game. He's playing great. Yeah, I mean, this I I just don't I don't get it. The crazy part too is they they lost or they almost lost to Minnesota, and then a couple of weeks ago they lost to Penn State, which Penn State is honestly no good. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know either. It's it's pretty pretty wild to be honest. Um, the other team that I wanted to bring up was uh, I I keep wanting to bring up Northwestern, and today they play Purdue, and they beat them once at home. I don't see them beating them on the road. It would be crazy. But yeah, um, and they would definitely make it in the top twenty-five if they were able to be- beat Purdue. Right now, Northwestern is fourth in the Big Ten, mm-hmm. six and three in conference. Yeah, um, I don't know if anybody noticed we have not mentioned those Michigan teams. We haven't. There's good reason for that. Yeah, uh, Michigan and Michigan State played last night, and uh, nobody watched because it was on Peacock. Listen, uh, I'll say for uh, Michigan is, for lack of a better word, shitty. Yeah. Um last in the in the conference, mm-hmm. 2 and 8. 7 and 14 overall. Uh Juwan Howard has sunk the program. Mm-hmm. I don't watch them. Last time I watched them was when they beat Ohio State on MLK Day, which was hilarious. Mm. That they they played like two complete games all season. They have the talent to do it more, but they just they just can't do it. Yeah. Because they're not well coached enough. And they had the lead in this game at halftime. And they got blown out in the second half. Yeah. 48 They They can't put together whole games. They just can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they'll, they like, play different defenses. They're not good at any of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they just suck. Yeah. Michigan basketball is terrible. If you can't beat Michigan State when Tyson Walker only scores 12 points, yeah, that's a problem. Jay Nakin, seven threes. Yeah, he did finally have a good game, which was nice to see. But, uh... I still don't believe in this Michigan MSU State. hit nine threes. He hit seven of them. Yeah. Which shows something. St- they're, they're still not very good. Yeah, I still don't believe in this Michigan State team right now. And uh, they haven't proven anything else otherwise. They're right in the middle of the Big Ten. Um, yeah, they, they I'm looking at the, they, they, uh, they got smacked by Northwestern. Mm-hmm. Uh, kept close with, with Illinois, but Illinois was clearly the better team. Yep. Blew out Rutgers. Uh, beat Minnesota by 10. 
barely beat Maryland, got smacked by Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. They lose to to bet to good teams and they beat bad teams. Yep. <laughs> that's that's what Michigan State is. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't get any well, I guess it's actually not too bad of an end of their season. They don't have too many tough games. In February, they play Maryland again, Minnesota again. They do have Illinois, but that game is at home, so there's a chance they could actually make a surprise there. Then they play Penn State, Michigan again. If they have a winning record, yeah, this this is a very cushy month yeah. for them. They go 5-2 and two in this stretch. Mm-hmm. They, they might have a chance to make a surprise run at the end of the season. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm feeling that if they're going to make the tournament, they're going to be like another 10-11 seed type deal and – Hope for the best. I don't Most know. likely. But yeah. shouts out to Northwestern and Nebraska for being uh fourth and fifth in the conference right now. Yeah. Stepping up. I respect it a lot. Like we uh, we like we say every year, the fun part of college basketball in the last I don't know, it's five, six years now, is that it seems like any given night a team can knock somebody off. Um and to me, that makes it a lot more exciting that we're not seeing the same exact teams every single year uh, make it far. So, kind of a wait and see. All right. Can I make one last update? Yeah, go for it. Uh, Oakland is now second place on the horizon. Okay. Eight and three, uh, tied with Youngstown State, who I'm, I'm, I'm sure will probably jump over them. Mm-hmm. Uh, 13 and nine overall. If they go on a run, they got a chance. Make the tournament. Let's see it. I don't want to say what's on my mind right now, Joey, because uh, I want to say some things to you. You just made me a little upset. <laughs> Oakland making a run? Uh, do you, you said that with a – you're hey, laughing right now, so you you, 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 didn't, you didn't really say it with a straight face. Come on, face. let's try it. Let's, they, they should try it. You're, you're right. They should try to make it past – Let's let's move on. Let's move on. All right. Waste of a team. Waste. The NFL playoffs. Touchy topic right now for Lions fans. As we know, the Lions made it into the NFC title game. And as many of us know now, the Lions lost. They blew a 24-7 lead at halftime. A lot of flukes, but also a lot of mistakes. And their season is over when they were literally 30 minutes away with a 17-point lead from going to the Super Bowl. The dream scenario that we all thought of was so close to coming true. The thing that we joked about a few weeks ago, and then we slightly got a little more serious and have gotten a little more serious each week about it, was so close. Everybody in this state Felt like it was going to happen. And then it was ripped away in the second half. How do you feel after this game, Malik? Was this, does this make all, like, we were so excited about this season. They basically did everything they needed to do this year. It was a successful season. But because of the manner that they lost, does it take all of that away? I don't think it takes all of it away. And I, I, I don't think you can say there's a curse anymore. Mm. Even with that second half being just like such a nightmare of events happening over and over again. Would you agree that this is one of the Lions best seasons in franchise history? Uh, They got close. They were very close to making a Super Bowl. In the Super Bowl. When was the last time that happened? I would say in the Super Bowl era because we weren't around back That's in the That's what 50s. I'm saying. So, yeah, the Super Bowl era started bo- even before we were alive. Right. So, as long as we've been alive, is this the Lions' best season? Oh, yeah. Easily. That means something. Mm-hmm. At least to me. Yeah. That means something. Yeah, I can, I can say that. And we can already start to have a topic of <laughs> – who is the better all-time quarterback for the Lions, Jared Goff or Matthew Stafford? That that answer is already here. We don't have to debate that. Like, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, it to me, it does kind of wipe away a lot of the success for the season. Now, I'm not going to say that I don't. I'm not going to sit here and be like, "Oh, the season was such a disappointment." I can appreciate what they did, but when you have a 17 point lead. 
and you're a team that is known for ground and pound, kill the clock in those scenarios, I would have expected more and that we would have been in the Super Bowl. Uh, so in that moment, my expectations changed and I felt like we needed to secure that victory to make it a, a true success. Because I always felt like if we made it to the Super Bowl, it didn't matter at that point. But being that close makes it a disappointment. Um, but if we would have made it to the Super Bowl and then got and then lost or something, I would have I would have been okay with it. I think. Um, so the manner that we lost stunk. The problem also being that it was mistakes on every level: offense, defense, even special teams hurt a lot because we didn't make that many mistakes throughout the season. Um, and yeah, it just, it sucks. Like, especially for guys like Josh Reynolds, who I think people immediately forgot of how good of a season he had or how good of a playoff run he had. He had clutch touchdowns in the other playoff games. And then he had happened to have one of his worst games. Um, just really stunk. Um, the other thing that was disappointing too was CJ Gardner Johnson talking a lot of trash and not being able to back it up. For me, I like the trash talk. I like being confident in yourself. But when you can't back it up and you literally have like one of your worst games of your career, that's pretty disappointing. So I don't know. It sucks. It's there was a lot of flukes, but um, I don't know. Where where did you think the biggest turning point was for you when you watched it? I'd say that, that first um, fourth and two conversion attempt where they didn't make it, Josh Reynolds dropped the pass. I'd say that was important, but to me, the one where the momentum was completely taken away and the 49ers never gave it back was the Jameer Gibbs fumble. Hmm. I think if the Lions keep the ball, they either just keep driving or they end up, if they get a three and out and punt it, it's still a better situation hmm. than having the 49ers on the 30 or 25 and ready to just punch it in within seconds. That Jameer Gibbs fumble pretty much put the nail in the coffin, even though they were still down. Yeah. But you could see the body language of the Lions. You could see the way the energy just wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. And Jameer Gibbs was dropping his head. I mean, I'm not saying there's no leadership on the team, but it didn't seem like anybody was, like, rushing to him to tell him to, like, pick his head up or something, like, we got the next drive. Right. They never got it back. Mm -hmm. Josh Reynolds couldn't catch a pass again until, like, the last drive. Mm -hmm. He couldn't catch another pass. The Amran Ross St. Brown connection was gone. Mm. Everything went bad. Yeah. They only ran Everything. the ball, I think, eight times in the second half as well. Yeah. And I know at one point, you know, you know, you're down and you have to start throwing, but it felt like even early on in the second half that they didn't try to establish the run as much. Yes, they got stuffed a couple times early in the second half, but it seemed like even after the Jameer Gibbs fumble that they were just, I don't know if they were nervous to run the ball. It was just weird. Uh, things got odd. Um, and it, it was just, it was a tough, tough loss because of all the mistakes. I think for me, it was mostly the Ayuk catch because it was kind of fluky and it's like, oh, now San Fran's like, wow, we just got one. Let's, let's take advantage of it. Yeah. And then the Gibbs fumble being in such uh, close territory, being able to score quickly once again, and just narrowing that lead so quick, that hurt. Uh, do you think that Dan Campbell deserves the blame? Like a lot of people were calling out Dan Campbell for his bad decision making, his not kicking. I, be I believe he deserves some blame, just like everybody else that was involved. Mm -hmm. But he did what he's been doing all season. Yeah, He did what's gotten them to that point. Mm -hmm. And it worked for a half. Right. I can't judge him for that. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, how do you blame him for what happened in the second half? Yeah. Especially with like, the, like drop, Josh Reynolds drop. drops a pass. A yeah. ball bounces off of Vildor's face. Uh, yeah, Jameer Gibbs fumbles the ball. Like, uh, how do you blame these things on a coach mm -hmm. when the players just aren't making plays? Yeah. That's kind of how I felt. I felt like, this is what Dan Campbell is. This is what we bought into. So you have to ride the good times and the bad. 
when it doesn't feel like it's worked out. But at, at the end of the day, like it felt like his play calling was correct. Like if Josh Reynolds catches one of those passes, we could have killed so much time, probably scored again, would have been a totally different ball game. And the only call that I even have a little bit of disgruntlement was maybe the last fourth down where they were in a decent field goal range. I know the analytics said that Badgley wasn't as good there, but I would have at least liked to try to tie it back up there. Um, but I understand the point of going for it. The The one that I'll like actually ridicule him on is when he ran the ball third and goal at the end of the game with a minute left and we have to use a timeout. So then we actually have to get an onside kick. Now, crazy enough, Craig Reynolds almost timed the crap out of that. That, that onside kick was cl- close to perfect, as yeah. much as you can get. Because if Craig Reynolds would have waited possibly yeah. one more second. He could have just tackled the guy that was getting ready to catch it. Yeah, potentially one more second, and that ball would have been at the 10-yard line. And it would have been incredible. Um, but unfortunately, it wasn't. And you have to go down to onside kick. And I would have liked to keep those timeouts so you could maybe make a stop. I'd rather hold... Uh, throw a Hail Mary, then get an onside, and then throw a Hail Mary, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, disappointing way to end the season. Um, credit to Brock Purdy for kind of shaking the the game manager stuff and the things that people were getting mad at him about. Um, but, yeah, tough way to end the season for the Lions. However, we got good news last week, or yes, we last did. week, yesterday, y- Yes, <laughs> that – Ben Johnson is officially staying as the offensive coordinator for the Lions. Um, Helps uh, bandage the wounds a little bit from Sunday, I think, being able to know that Ben Johnson's coming back. Uh, We still don't know about Aaron Glenn. He's still interviewing, apparently, but there's a chance that he could be coming back as well. Um, How do you feel about Ben Johnson coming back? Just good news all all around? I think it is. There there are some fans I know that felt like he has done too much in the second half of the season and he he just can't like balance out to like the genius mind he seemed to be. I think that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I mean, he made calls in, in this past game against the 49ers that got them extra plays. I mean, yeah. he's one of the most creative young co- play callers in the league. Mm-hmm. And yeah, sometimes it's it's a bit much, but I, I don't know how you give up on that. Yeah. It it wouldn't make sense. He schemed up against the 49ers and gave us a 24 to 7 lead going into halftime because of his play calling. That Jamison Williams end around the running that they did off uh where they did the they pulled the tackles and things like that. Penny Sewell, like I keep saying, is incredible. Watching him in that game was insane to see him get out in front of Jameer Gibbs on a lot of plays and be able to set blocks. Um, that's pretty crazy. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have Ben Johnson back. Um, Aaron Glenn, I think kind of proved himself towards the end of the season, especially in the 49ers game, actually felt like he, he played good defense. The team played good defense overall. Um, just gave up a couple plays here and there, but I would like to be able to run it back. And we have, I think the fifth most, most cap space in the NFL for this off season. Now we have to re-sign some guys. Uh, Jared Goff probably needs to be extended. I would rather get Penne Sewell and Amon Ross St. Brown extended early, if possible, as well. But we have money to bring people in. We're going to have our draft picks again. We're going to pick 29th, I believe. Yeah, it'd be 29th because Ravens getting 30. Um, So, yeah, there, there's a big offseason already coming up. And we're only a couple months away from the draft. And yeah, that, I think there's just a couple of pieces that we need um, coming this off season. What do you think would be like the highest priority for the Lions in this off season? Defense, whether it's signing, whether it's drafting. A lot of Lions fans on social media I've seen are saying Kool Aid McKinstry is mm-hmm. the next. I think he's going like uh, early to to mid first round. Mm-hmm. I don't think he'll fall to 29. That'd be crazy though. There will be linebackers, corners. A few other defensive linemen, you need help everywhere, but especially in the defensive backfield. Yeah. I think, I believe Jordan Lewis is going to be a free agent, Mm. and not just because he played at Michigan. I believe if he comes to Detroit, he's the best corner from the jump. Hmm. 
And I, I'm not even 100% sure if he's a number one guy. Like, there are only a few, like, no lockdown corners in today's right. game. Mm -hmm. But he's fundamentally sound, like, consistent. He's going to give you what you want out of the corner position. Yeah. And I also want them to target Mike Sainer still. Not just because he went to Michigan. I don't know. <laughs> Targeting but, a lot of Michigan guys. Kind of because they went to Michigan. Mm -hmm. They have the mentality. Like, Jordan Lewis coming back home, I feel like he would give everything yeah. for the Lions. And Mike Sainer still, I feel like he could step in and play the nickel position right now. Mm. Like, you take pressure off of Brian Branch and Kirby Joseph and let them free, freely run around and make plays. I feel like Mike Sainer still could do a great job, even being somewhat undersized, 5'10". I feel like he could be do a really good job. So do you let CJGJ go? This is a complicated one. A lot of Detroit Lions fans are saying they want him to walk. Yeah. Because his his attitude and how he carries himself mm -hmm. kind of doesn't match with what the team is. Yeah. And yeah, him waving at the San Francisco fans at the end of the first half. Mm-hmm. The the constant the constant like live streams and penalty, posts on social media the penalty that he got on Debo yeah like he he just does unnecessary things mm -hmm. and also his play wasn't at like the highest level this season that's my that's only, another thing that's my he only was like problem. one of the lowest graded defensive players in that 49ers game yeah because if he would have played to his normal level you could compare him to like Rasheed Wallace where he's kind of the talker and but he's backing it up yeah. He wasn't backing a up. A lot of times this season, he didn't back it up. Yeah. He did uh, in a few specific moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, I I think I like the cornerback class uh, of free agents rather than draft. So I, I don't know the list of free agents yet, so you would probably know more than me. So, for me, like... But Jordan Lewis would be an affordable option that they could probably... Yeah. I, I know drafting a corner would probably be good for depth, um, yeah. but the, the free agent class... Um, if Jordan Lewis is there, he's available. Stephon Gilmore is there. Jalen Johnson. After what he did with Dallas this year, it, it kind of seems like he might be on a down slide a little bit. Some people think he's that, still good, but some people think that the reason that Deron Bland got so many picks was because yeah. they went away from Stephon Gilmore. That's a, that's a good point. I don't know. Yeah. I don't watch tape on the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, to be get, honest, getting him for like a one or two year deal wouldn't hurt. Right, he definitely wouldn't. He'd be the number one guy, just like a veteran guy. Yeah. It's an option. I, he wouldn't be my top option. But there's also guys like Jalen Johnson from the Bears might be available. Legarius Sneed would be a heck of a signing. Don't know what the Chiefs are going to do with him, um, depending on if he's asking for a lot of money or you know they win the Super Bowl. He might want some money. Um, but it's kind of a wait and see there. Um, trying to think who else there. There was somebody else, too, that I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, but, it, yeah, in the draft, if, like, Kool-Aid was to fall, um, a lot of people want to draft Cooper DeGene from Iowa. Listen, I, what, he's more of a safety, but he plays corner, mm -hmm. and he's an athletic beast. Yeah. Like, he is a, a high-level punt returner. Mm -hmm. You could put him anywhere in the defensive backfield. Right. That would not be a bad draft pick. Yeah. So, that would be an option. Um, I like... Oh, I just lost my train of thought. But, um, yeah, I think there's some options in the secondary. And then I also want that other pass rusher, I think, is a big deal. Um, That I don't know who's available or who I would want. Or who I, yeah, would want. I, I feel like free agency is kind of maybe where you look there first. Yeah. Because I, I haven't looked deeply into the draft class in terms of edge rushers. I don't think it's elite. Yeah. Like it's not the like the Aiden Hutchinson mm -hmm. and Trayvon Walker year. Right. Yeah, and, so. and people are talking about uh like Brian Burns again. I I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh they've talked about like Josh Allen from the Jaguars. That would be huge if they that, could get that him. That would be nice. That would be huge. Again, he just I, had an elite season. I just don't know if it's gonna be able to, to happen. Yeah, those guys are asking for a lot of money. Right. And that's kinda like my concern. But I mean we do have cap space with we could do get things yeah. done. We could. They get, could probably sign one guy to a big. Mm -hmm. Josh Allen and Aiden Hutchinson on both edges would be huge. Yeah. So so th there's some there's some options there, but um yeah I, I'm I'm with you though I I think defense would be a big one. How do you feel about the linebackers? I would because I 
Mm. I don't know why they didn't like let him play a ton of snaps all throughout the season. Malcolm Rodriguez was really good. Yeah. In the most important game mm-hmm. of the season. My like, brother, why were they not playing him a ton during the season? My brother and I were kind of joking about it because I was like, "Oh, I'd like to see Rodrigo back in there," and he's like, "Ah, oh, he's just you know he's been replaced with Jack Campbell and all this stuff." And Jack Campbell is coming along still. And we but- were we were kind of joking, and my brother's like, "Yeah, he's he's kind of been the the special teams guy, played a little fullback, of course, when Cabinda was injured." And I was like, "I don't know, I just feel like he's a gamer." And then he had a great game. He had an interception. Yeah. He had a great hit on Christian McCaffrey. He mm-hmm. was. He is a really good linebacker. Yeah, I, I think I I like keeping him around. I think he's a good depth piece. I still don't know if he's like starting caliber. He obviously can fill in yeah. as we've seen, but his instincts are like top notch. Yeah, for a guy that's not the greatest athlete. Right. Um. So I, I could see getting some more depth at linebacker would also be helpful. The other thing that people are pointing out getting a guard because yeah. Jonah Jackson health problems. If you want to re-sign him, it's a risk. So it's probably better to let him go, even though he's. They've won a lot of games with him. Yeah, but that's a tough one for this offseason. What are you going to do with him? Um, Graham Glasgow is a year older, so at this point, getting some line depth would be really important. Finding a successor for Frank Ragnow, I think already isn't he only five years in? But he's been talking like he keeps talking like he wants to retire or something weird like. I don't know if it's the injuries getting to it's just weird. I, I don't think the organization is thinking that honestly yet. It, they might not be, but it, I've just it just see, feels like there's been some weird weird cryptic stuff with him. Yeah. When we get into more like Lions draft talk, we'll get into some of the paranoid thing. That's like yeah. a kind of kind of a paranoid theory. Even yeah. though it's possible mm-hmm. he could. Um, but how do you feel? Do you think they should just like stick with developing Chase Coda and and uh the kid they took from North Carolina last year. Antoine Green. Antoine Green. Or do you think they should draft another guy? Because after Amon Ra, I still like Josh Reynolds a ton, but that game was scary, yeah. that NFC Championship. Yeah. How do you do that in the biggest one of the biggest games of the season? Yeah, that's fair. Um. Oh, the thing that I thought about real quick, I want to re-sign Emmanuel Mosley on another one year. Yeah. Just give him one he more chance. He was supposed to be the number one guy, honestly. Yeah. I just want to give him one more chance because I don't think it's going to break the bank or anything at this point. Um, but going but back he, to that. Do you draft a receiver in like the fourth round maybe? Like, I'm this, okay. this, this receiver class is pretty deep. Yeah, I'm okay going receiver whether we draft one. I think, I mean, we could get a guy like Hunter Renfro that we've talked about before. Um, sounds like Vegas is going to move on from him. I wouldn't mind that as like another veteran kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that messes up with like him playing the slot and Amon Ra being in the slot area a lot too. That if that would mess anything up, I mean, but, you could put them on opposite sides of the field, right? They, yeah, because they start, don't have to work out of the same cause, spot. Because you could start to think too, like having a bunch of crossers with Amon Ra, St. Brown, Hunter Renfro, and San Laporta would be Listen, pretty interesting. Yeah. Um. So and then if Jamison Williams had a hell of a game. Uh, if he keeps like, developing, I, I trust Amon Ra and and I trust his development, Jamos. Yeah. And I but like I, I like Jamos' attitude towards the team in the city, so I want to keep him around. Maybe turn him into the number two. Is what? How many years does Khalif Raymond have left? I don't know. I, was, I I didn't know. I assumed he probably wasn't coming back. Maybe mm-hmm. like Donovan Peoples Jones, they traded for him. I assume he'll still be here. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like I uh, maybe they should spend a draft pick on another guy. Yeah, I don't I don't mind going after a wide receiver. Like I said. I, I don't care if it's either draft or even in free agency, but I would like to just add one more depth piece because I'm kind of with you where I don't know about our our third, fourth guys that might come into into play later yeah. on in the season. I want to still re-sign Josh Reynolds, I think. Um, maybe do another one-year deal or something like that with him. But, yeah, I'm not sure. It, Chase Cota got a lot of hype in the preseason and stuff, but – he didn't he never like I think the field. Antoine Green made like two appearances mm-hmm. in the season. I never saw Chase Cota making it right. So yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's one that I I would I would want, but not sure exactly. I don't know yeah. what that the class offense looks like. is honestly for the most part set, but you mm-hmm. oh you can always get better, obviously. Right. Yeah, like I said, if, if we're talking offense, I want offensive line. Yeah. And then defense, basically anything you can get. Except for safety, I guess. Safety is pretty much our, our safeties are great. The future of safety is set 
Yeah. With Kirby Joseph and Brian Branch. Mm-hmm. So, kind of good there. Um, oh, the last thing that I wanted to mention. Are you okay giving Jared Goff anything? What do you mean? Like, extending him for $50 million a year. Who's... I, I, I don't know. that's basically I, I don't the market. Know the, I was about to say, I don't know the workings of, like, the highest paid. I know how much Mahomes got, and then Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow is the highest paid in the league right now, isn't yeah, he, yeah. with his extension? Mm-hmm. Where would that put Jared Goff? He, it's right in the wheelhouse of where everybody else is at. I mean, after, I don't know listen, exactly. It, it would depend on years and things like that. Um, I don't think he's worth Mahomes' healthy Burrow, mm-hmm. like Josh Allen money. But you you have to pay him for what he just what he's done. Yeah, what he's done mm-hmm. can't be like understated. Mm-hmm. He just did a milestone thing. Yeah, in Detroit football history. Mm-hmm. The only thing that people have brought up, and the radio was talking about it today, was maybe there's some wild chance with Ben Johnson coming back, being all in on the team, wanting to run it back. Maybe Jared Goff structures his contract in a way that he takes a little bit of a pay cut so that we can sign a couple more guys. Mm. Don't know if it would happen. Don't know if I need it to happen. But I'm at the point where I'm willing to pay Jared Goff the $50 million if he needs it. I agree with you. Maybe he's not quite as talented as those guys. But this he is, got it done. But it's starting to remind me of, like, you remember when we paid Stafford and everybody freaked out about it, and then, like, two years down the line, that was one of the lowest contracts in the league? Yeah. The earlier you get it done the better usually. And if they have to, like, technically he could wait another year. And I feel like that would be a mistake because then you have somebody else that sets the market again. Um, And I think we're just right now, we just, I think you give him 50 million a year if that's what he needs to get it done because he works in the system. We know that this system works for him and that's what you would have to pay him. So I'm okay with it because I don't, I feel like if we get a new quarterback, we have to start completely over, and then we might be in trouble. Listen, did, throughout the season, there have been insane fans saying the, the Hendon Hooker chance. Yeah, they're still out there. Now, I want to see him, like, in the preseason. I want to see what he looks like in the system. Yeah. Because he was known for his accuracy mm-hmm. and sitting back there and dropping dimes. Yeah. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what he – and adding his legs into it, but mm-hmm. Jared Goff is the quarterback. Yeah, and maybe he becomes, you know, the backup quarterback and he has like a – there's like a special package for him on certain yeah. plays. It could be useful for this yeah. offense. Giving him a goal line package would, yeah. would be really interesting. Right. You want to trust Goff in a lot of those scenarios, like fourth and shorts, but there might be certain plays that it's like, let's put Head and Hooker in there, give them another look, yeah, and uh, see what happens. But, yeah. Um, not going to talk about the Super Bowl. Super Bowl is next week. We could preview it a little bit if we wanted to. I'm not going to watch it, probably. I'll be honest. That's <laughs> I'm how watching I, the Super Bowl. I mean, I'll I'm probably watching. watch it, but... I, it's a it's a disappointment for most NFL fans. Normally, I People would, wanted Baltimore, Detroit. Yeah. Normally, I would have wanted San Francisco to win, but after the way that they beat us, I don't want them to win. I don't want uh, the Chiefs to win either, so... Yeah, it's, it's going to be a rough watch for me. So, uh, yeah, going to be a tough off season, but I think it's going to be an exciting off season. We got a lot of stuff to do, but uh, it starts with the draft in a couple months, and uh, we'll start all over again. But I think this team is going to be exciting going forward, which is good. Um, Next week, I don't know what's going to go on now that football is basically over. So we're going to transition we, probably. We should we should start getting maybe into a little bit more college basketball, like you said. Yeah, that's what I was saying. We'll get probably some, make get that Get some transition. mid-major research going. Yeah, I'll, I'll start yeah. diving deep, starting to watch a little bit more yeah. games. Let, let the people know who they should look out for coming up to March. Yeah. Yeah, break, some teams maybe you should bet on. Break out the old ESPN3 a little bit. Oh, boy. <laughs> yes, I, I like how you're talking that. to me right now. Listen, I tuned into a main Albany game on ESPN Plus last week. There we go. Get when, I'm, the, when I'm bored, I just turn into a random game. Yeah, get real into the degeneracy of college basketball. Gotta love it. So, yeah, that's where we'll get going. But, uh, yeah, this has been Views from the Sidelines, and we'll see you guys uh, next week. <sighs> the Pistons are back, Joey. How does it feel? Back to what? <laughs>